Hang on. Soon and very soon. By the way, if you're on live stream and you want copies of some of the material we handed out, pretty much all the material specific to Cowboy Church, we can email that to you. So feel free to shoot me an email and I will try to get that back to you within a month or two. I, I mean a few days. All right. We are still on Listening Guide 2, down to local missions and ministry partnerships. One of the handouts you received should say investment plan on one side, and we'll explain that in a moment. And then on the other side, you'll notice, well, mine's dated, 2021 missions. You should probably say 2023 missions. You got it. So, um, again, because of Acts 1-8, and want you to know that, and we'll talk about where the resources come from, but part of our calling as a church is to be faithful to Acts chapter 1, verse 8, which says that we have a responsibility to be witnesses for Jesus. Here's a free sermon. If you're a follower of Jesus, you are a witness for him. The real question is, what kind of witness? Are you a good one? Not so good. Are you faithful? Not so faithful. Are you generous? You want me to quit yet? Or stingy? So, as a church, we invest in other ministries and missions. Here's been our experience through the years. Sometimes we talk so much about mission work, international missions, that people at some good American, red-blooded patriots, they're like, hmm, what are you doing here? And so we try to have a balanced approach, although most of us know and realize that it's still much easier to hear about Jesus here in the United States of America than it is in a lot of other places. However, under the missions part, and mine's kind of outdated, um, of all the tithes and offerings, we'll talk about that in a little bit, of all the financial resources that come to Cowboy Church, uh, right off the top, 5% goes to the Gila Valley Association. Uh, if you don't like the way they run their business, you can talk to me because I'm the leader of that organization as well. And I continue to do that on a part-time basis. Uh, that organization is committed primarily to reaching people in Pinal County, but we also have some partnerships overseas in West Africa, some of the same places that we partner at Cowboy Church. The 3% off the top goes to the Arizona Southern Baptist Convention. Some of that, go, all of, some of that stays in Arizona, the big portion. And then some goes to the cooperative program. The cooperative program was started in 1925. I want you to hear this because I believe it has been blessed because of a biblical principle. In the Old Testament, if you've read that, you know that the people gave tithes to the Levites. And then all that the Levites gave, got, received, they gave 10% of that to the priest and the high priest. And so that same model is the New Testament, we encourage tithing. But we don't keep it all here. We invest at least 10% into other missions and ministries around the world. The cooperative program was a mechanism designed back in 1925 so that cooperating churches in the network, instead of having a seminary president come beg for money for his seminary this year and then the next year some from another seminary, more realistically, it came to this. The guys from the foreign mission board were asking for money this week probably next month, somebody hears from the North American Mission Board. And so, are you aware that one reason lost people don't want to come to church is because they're afraid all we want is their money? Have you noticed we, I don't think, do, do you think, we don't talk a lot about money at Cowboy Church. Have you noticed? We worship with tithes and offerings. By the way, for those of you that are filling in the blanks, I missed one. On our music worship, it's all about worship, not performance. It's important for you to hear. That doesn't mean, you notice, we don't disallow people from applauding and clapping. There's a fine line. Always try to remember when you're clapping, it's all right to be applauding. Great job the musicians did. But the greatest applause should go to the God that we're worshiping. Amen? Amen. And so our standard is not, and our music worship is not performance. Just like the standard for preaching is not performance. I'm not interested in doing a dog and pony show. You've watched TV, the YouTube. There's way too much competition in that field. There's way too much entertainment. We have a very different high calling to be faithful to preaching and teaching the truth and singing and worshiping the truth. So, uh, 
uh, under PCC missions, that money that goes to the cooperative program, some of that goes on to support six seminaries located across the United States, one of which my grandfather went to, my dad went to, and I've gone to. Uh, some of that money goes to the North American Mission Board to help us start churches in North America. Some of it goes to the International Mission Board. And so that's kind of the work beyond our county and our town. The Gila Valley Association, as I said, works primarily in this county. And then you'll notice, I think I have it divided up on your, on your missions plan. There's some money goes to church planting, outreach to cowboys and cowgirls, collegiate ministry, international partnerships, and then local ministries. Those numbers tend to change every year depending on needs and requests. Um, and I'll talk about this later in the next session, too. You have an investment plan. For now, I want you to notice in, well, that was 2021. Who's got the current 2023 copy? All of you. How, what's the percentage for missions, the second category? 17? 8. 8. Okay. Just so you know, year to year, we have extra requests. We have partners that often need more. And so, uh, in a way, I'm excited to see what it is this year. Uh, as you know, with the building project being delayed, we continue to prepare for that. But it's kind of hard to be stingy when God's blessed us with so much. And so, generally speaking, Cowboy Church forwards about 20% of what God entrusts to us. We take about 20% and invest in other missionaries and ministries. And so you see a listing there. I don't think I did fill in the blanks for you. If I did, I'll have to fill those in later. All right. Anybody have any questions? Well, we're not, questions are going to go at the end. So let's move to our Discover PCC3, third portion of the seminar, how we do what we do and why. So number one, what we believe, who we are, what we believe and why. Number two, what we do and why. And now how we do what we do and why. That's kind of a mouthful. We are unashamedly a pastor-led church. Titus chapter 1 talks about pastors. We believe the New Testament plainly teaches that the terms shepherd, elder, and bishop are all interchangeable. They all refer to the one person, the one office of pastor. Pastor leads, members follow. Technically, we do not have a board. The board I mentioned to you earlier is for legal purposes primarily. But, oh, we'll talk about that but here in a minute. No, we'll po po point it out now. The reason we have pastors both from our church and other churches on that board is so that if somebody says to me or somebody says to you about me or any of our pastors, well, they have all this leadership or all this decision-making power. Who's holding them accountable? I can assure you the men on our board hold us accountable. They're aware of our plans, of our mission, of our budget, of our finances. The more important thing is this. If one of us steps out of line, those guys will be the first ones. They love us. They support us. But if we step out of line with the word of God, they would be the first one to raise the red flag. Or if you're playing football, to throw the yellow flag and to say, are you sure this is what you need to be doing? However, as a pastor-led church, pastors at our cowboy church make the decisions and handle all of the resources, including money. That might be new to some of you, depending on your background. We, again, remember, Dad and I together have done this for 100 years. We've seen a whole lot of what doesn't work or what doesn't work well. Our accountability is to each other, to other board members. 1 Timothy 5, 19-21. If you don't look up any other verse, I would encourage you to look this one up. Because as a follower of Jesus, it is critical that you know and understand this couple of verses. 1 Timothy 5. We do not believe pastors are perfect. We do not believe pastors do not make mistakes. However, the scripture plainly teaches about elders and about the church. And if you'll look at 1 Timothy 5, verse 19, it says, Do not receive an accusation against an elder except from two or three witnesses. 
I'm going to stop there because I hope you see that the Scripture protects elders. The Scripture says that if you're going to accuse an elder, that means accuse a pastor of wrongdoing, that you need to make sure there are at least two others. You can't get away with one. But you got to have somebody else that agrees with you in that accusation. Because the Bible says it's a serious matter to accuse a pastor. Now that sounds great, doesn't it? Well, you're thinking, why does he get special privilege? It is a special privilege. However, in our culture especially, sadly, there is one realm of accusations that any of us could be accused and no evidence whatsoever is required. And you and I could get thrown right into jail. So never forget, our free society is not quite as free as it could be, should be. But this speaks primarily to the church and its members and the relationship between the pastor and his people. The reason for that, too, is that without this protection, anytime somebody gets a burr under their saddle, it, it just clogs up the whole works. And so here's what I want you to know that I know and that you need to know. Verse 20 says that even though we have this protection, verse 20 says those who are sinning rebuke in the presence of all that the rest also may fear. So it's a protection, but it's very costly. Because when a pastor does mess up, when there are two or three that accuse and the accus accusation is true, what happens to the pastor? Our sin goes public. Now, it's not that way for everybody else. That's why you can come to me, you can talk to me, I'm not going to broadcast it, I'm going to pray for you, I'm going to tell you what the Bible says, I'm going to encourage you to repent, make things right, but I'm not going to drag you up here, if your sin did not affect the whole congregation, I'm not going to drag you up here and make you tell everybody. But if you're a pastor and you mess up, guess where you get to stand? It's like right here. And so we don't, we take our responsibility very seriously and instead of basically cutting the pastor's legs off and say, we're not going to let you lead because you might mess up, our position is we lead, but we lead with understanding that it is a high and a noble privilege. Financial resources, tithes and offerings. At Cowboy Church, for years, we've used the verbiage of investment instead of spending. When it comes to money matters, we have learned that if you spend money, you get to spend it once. If you invest money or other resources, you get to do it a whole bunch of times. Some of you are money people. You know exactly what I'm talking about. If you don't, just hang on for this ride. In the first five years of Cowboy Church, our partners, so that some of these information that you have, the North American Mission Board, the Gila Valley Association, another local church, those entities gave money every month to the Pinal County Cowboy Church. And in five years, some of our partners invested over $70,000 to help us get started and to plant this church. However, after that, so that's 12 years ago, Cowboy Church operates solely on the gifts of its people, tithes and offerings of people. There's not a big Cowboy Church across the pond that sends us money. There's not another church you know, across the nation or even in the state that loves us and says, we want to send you money to help do what you're doing. And that's as it should be. Part of the reason we're independent, autonomous, is because we pay our own way. When you take money from other people, what happens? They can say it's free, no strings attached. I'm happy to tell you, and we did this on this basis, but also on others. During COVID, when the government offered us money, I know of other churches and other organizations that took government money because it was supposedly free and unattached. But there's a principle, and we chose not to violate that principle. If you take money from somebody else, they sometimes feel like they have authority to tell you what to do with it or what to do with your church. And so we don't do that. Instead, we depend on what we believe is God's method for funding and resourcing his kingdom. If you still have, well, if you got the New Testament, you're just going to have to trust me. If you got a copy of all of God's word, I want you to find Malachi chapter 3. By the way, there are some mistakes in the study guide because I drafted it. 
And I've already told you I'm not perfect. <laughs> you have living proof. That should be Malachi 3, 8 to 11. Someday I'll update it. I had no idea because of COVID that it's been two years since we did the seminar until I looked at my notes. Malachi 3, 8 to 11, Old Testament, hear the word of God. Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, in what way have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. And try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground, nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts. Oh, we might as well put the last one on. And all nations will call you blessed, for you will be a delightful land, says the Lord of hosts. That's Old Testament. That's God speaking to his chosen people. Do you know what the New Testament teaches about God's chosen people? Give it all. Number one, as a follower of Christ, we are a kingdom of priests. We are brought into God's forever family. We're as special in a way because we're grafted in to the people of God. He's right. The only way you can be born again is what? Deny yourself, take up the cross, and follow him. If you've read the New Testament, Jesus asked us to give all which is a great reason to talk about this Old Testament principle of tithing. We encourage, that means we're not going to browbeat you, we're not going to check your records or anything like that as far as your, I have no idea how much money you make. You could know pretty easily how much money I make. Don't ask. But um, this is between you and God. My dad says it this way, why would we not teach tithing? Because from childhood, my parents taught me to tithe. Guess what? From childhood, I've never been hungry. I've never been homeless. I've always had clothes on my back. Obviously, you can tell my, my physique, I've had more than enough food to eat. And that's just physical blessings. And then there's the spiritual blessings. Because I'm crowding 60, I can tell you that for over 50 years of my life, I've been part of a church that faithfully supports sharing the gospel around the world. That means in all the churches I've been in, some of that money went to tell other people about Jesus. There is no way I could describe or explain because I have no idea. I have no idea what investment that simple tithe and offering has made in God's kingdom. Someday, I believe we'll know. Someday, when we go to glory and we stand before God, we might just get to see how many hundreds of people came to faith in Christ because men and women simply chose to be obedient in the tithe. For the good Bible thumpers in the place, they're going to tell you that in the New Testament, the tithe is the bare minimum. It's the beginning place. I can tell you this. You cannot read the New Testament and not realize that Jesus talks a whole lot more about money than you realize. Now, that doesn't mean that I'm going to start advocating for a new jet. <laughs> but I did see a guy in a Mercedes this week, and I thought, what would they think at Cowboy Church if I rolled in in a Mercedes? Don't worry, they don't make pickups. To my knowledge, Mercedes, if they do, it's not a good one. I shouldn't be nice. It's probably a good one. But anyway, I digress. I'm an American. I'm going to drive an American pickup. Now they cost more They cost more than a Mercedes anyway, I think. So <laughs> I shouldn't have told you that. Now we're off base. But anyway, um, what I want you to hear is this. Important to understand that Cowboy Church is supported by the people of Cowboy Church. And the blessings that we have seen through the years are absolutely phenomenal. It is our financial base for daily operations. Our investment plan, you'll notice about 50% goes to salary and benefits for our employees. By the way, uh, today we still only have one, technically one full-time employee. And the only reason he's full-time is because he's got to work two jobs. And so Pastor Steve Doka serves in many areas as our associate pastor here at Cowboy Church, overseeing our live stream system, all of that. And now he's also leading our worship band, some. But he also is our campus missionary at CAC. Everybody else on staff draws, that gets paid, has another job. Or they're retired. This is not their only source of income. We started it that way. Remember, Dad started as a volunteer? Well, he had already retired, so early years. 
he was always pretty much drew a part-time salary. That's one reason why we've been able to invest a whole lot of money in missions. It's also a reason why we have, we believe, about 30 days from now we'll have a bid and we are pretty confident, real close to confident, that we'll have every bit of money in the bank that we need already to build a new building. Amen? And what I want you to hear is that that's because of a lifestyle of stewardship, but also of generosity. By the way, if you, a lot of people only give when they show up to worship. A tither always gives 10%. Because we've launched a new app, some of you have set up your giving based on what you receive, and it's automatic. And whether it's the first of the month or twice a month, the money automatically comes out of your checking account and comes to Cowboy Church. If, I have, if you don't know about the app, you need to download the app. That's just one of the good features. You'll find it under Pinal County Cowboy Church. One of my favorite stories, uh, one of our young men got in some trouble, got thrown in jail. It was a pretty long sentence. But one day as we were counting the tithes and offerings, I noticed an envelope, and it had his name on it. And I thought to myself, now how can you be tithing to your church when you're locked up? I discovered that this young man had sold, or apparently he had his grandparents sell his drum set, and he asked his grandmother to give a tithe of what he made on the drum set to the church. I like to tell that because most of us don't have any excuse. If you're going to tithe, let me encourage you to tithe consistently and have a plan so you don't miss. Even if you get thrown in jail. Don't call me, just send your tithe. No, that's not what I... <laughs> <laughs> through the years, um, through the years, uh, people have left significant gifts to the church. Uh, several years ago, in the middle of our building project that we're still trying to raise funds for, a gentleman from another state that worships with us in the wintertime sold his business, retired, sold his business, and sent a significant chunk of change to Cowboy Church. Other people, several people in the church, have written Cowboy Church into their last will and testament. And just this last year, after a long year of probate, a gentleman left his estate to the church, which included his bank accounts, a couple of vehicles, and a home. And so those are all things that people who love Jesus and love Cowboy Church have done. And if you ever need to talk about your estate, you let me know. At one time, I thought I had a guy lined up to do that, but we don't. But if you're interested, I've got about one sheet of information, probably a half sheet of information that you need to know. It's very important if you're going to leave anything to the church that you have the legal name of the church, the legal addresses. And let me just say, please, unless if there's no other option, you can list me as your personal representative. But I've done that once, and I hope to never do it again. That is a huge, huge undertaking. However... If you're going to list my name anywhere, it's helpful for it to be spelled correctly. So, all lessons I learned handling one estate. Moving right along. Uh, notice we call it an investment plan, not a budget. Many churches call this plan budget. And that's not bad, except, again, 100 years of experience. There's some people that are just like, I almost said an inappropriate word. Uh, if it's not in the budget, we can't spend it. And people treat the budget like it's the word of God. No, the budget is simply a spending plan. And we call it an investment plan for this reason. Since we make most of the financial decisions as pastors and leaders, that's the question we ask ourselves on every expense. Is this an investment in the kingdom of God? Will this help us reach more people for Christ? Will this help us continue the mission of telling the world about Jesus? Uh, some of you know we post the financial report every month. What you may not know, if you ever are concerned, all you have to do is text me, call me, or email me. I'll send you the monthly detailed report. If you can stand it, I can. I mean, it's long. PDF file. But if you want to know, we have nothing to hide, which is why we're very comfortable hand handling the resources the way we do, because we're happy to be totally transparent. Facilities, resources. God has blessed us with this piece of land and buildings. In the early years, we actually rented the building we're sitting in, in the early years of Cowboy Church, was actually complete in itself. 
There were restrooms at the back, kitchen, classrooms, fellowship hall. Originally, you could only squeeze about 100 people in here. There used to be a walk-in baptistry behind here. You would have been in a different room, Sandy, and that was a different room. And if you, the walk down memory lane, all you have to do is look up at the ceilings. And you better do it because by this time next year, that piece of history hopefully will be gone. But you can see where the walls used to be up against the ceilings. And it so happens by God's providence and planning that when this was built, there were no load-bearing walls. And so after five years, the church that was leasing their facility to us on Tuesdays and Saturdays, they disbanded. They gave their property first to the association that I lead and serve. And then within about a month, we turned it over to the Cowboy Church, and they have been responsible for it ever since. We began with five acres with this building. And then, now it's getting to be a long time ago. About 10 years ago, we added the new restrooms, the offices, the classrooms in the back. The reason we bought the adjacent properties, the West Building property, as well as the Steel Building and the Bunkhouse property, primarily was for parking. In the early days, our team roping events were so well attended that we needed more parking space. We were concerned because team ropers were having to park along the street, concerned the neighbors might complain. There was also a season when we had team ropings on Sunday morning simultaneously offering three worship services. They were like ants. There were cars, pickups and trailers all over this. There were cars here. We even used the neighbor's park, property to park and shuttle people back and forth. And so the adjacent properties we purchased, Cowboy Church, the only time Cowboy Church owed any money we owed it to the founding pastor. I think he fronted us some money to get through a property deal. But Cowboy Church is not in the habit of borrowing money. We don't plan to borrow money. Because if I have to explain that to you, you're asleep at the switch. Let me just say, we don't want to be like America and owe a gazillion trillion dollars to everybody else in the world. And also because of what the Bible teaches, but also just to be faithful and good stewards of what God has provided with us. Because of our facilities, we meet on campus three or four times a week for worship. We also have children's classes, Roundup Homeschool Ministry. That's a group of homeschool families. We have one family now that originally several other families were a part of Cowboy Church. And they were meeting at another church here in town. They asked for a new place to meet. And so they asked if they could meet here. They've met here for several years. Uh, most of the families do not go to Cowboy Church. However, we host them so that every Wednesday morning we stand here and the children pledge both the flags. They pledge the word of God. They have a memory verse and they hear for a few minutes whatever Pastor Tim wants to tell them. Amen. <laughs> I'm happy to report that most of these families are Christian families. Most of them are involved in churches. And our current leader of the Roundup Homeschool Ministry has been very proactive in saying that you can only teach in this homeschool ministry if you will teach according to the Constitution and bylaws of Cowboy Church and not contrary. So that doesn't mean they're all exactly like-minded, but it does mean they commit themselves not to teach anything cattywampus. That means unorthodox according to what we believe the Bible teaches. We use this property for team ropings in the cool months. We're a month away. If you're looking for something to do, we're going to have you some jobs. Sometimes we host a 4-H horse show. This year, we may be adding some other horse events. For a couple years, we've also hosted the Grandy Fiddle Championship. All of those are opportunities we use to introduce people to Cowboy Church, to introduce people to Jesus, to share the gospel with people. Uh, the West Building is also used for Narcotics Anonymous, two different groups, one on Monday night, one on Wednesday night. Uh, we're also partner with a counseling, a Christian counseling service. Sometimes they use the buildings, the bunkhouse. Some of you don't even know what that is or where it is. You need to drive around a little bit. Someday we'll do an open house. But if you get lost over here on the back corner of the, bit of the property, there's a bunkhouse. It's a small one-bedroom house that has been remodeled. It came with the property we bought for land, but it's been remodeled. Very nice, fully appointed kitchen, bath, living room, TVs, cooking utensils. It's even got some groceries in there if you were starving. But it is primarily for pastors and missionaries. When we have guest speakers, when we have people passing through, then we have a place to provide for pastors and missionaries, ministry partners. Occasionally, we've used it for other situations. People resources. 
The most important resource we have at Cowboy Church is people. It's not the land. It's not the building. It's not even the great Cowboy Church band. Because of the definition of the church, our most valuable resource is people. Cowboy Church, we encourage people to work jobs. We do not give titles. Because the Bible talks about deacons, I know what a deacon is. Uh, I'm not necessarily convinced that it's an office. Because if you were a servant, who cares if you had an office? (laughs) That kind of goes contrary to what some of you may have been taught and learned. But the New Testament meaning of the word deacon is servant. And again, in a hundred years, we have found a lot of churches where the office of deacon is used to control, to cajole, to run things, to power boss, and to keep things dead and dying. And so, obviously, we're not interested in that kind of a position at Cowboy Church. Uh, But if it means servant, then we have a lot of servants at Cowboy Church. Leadership, I've already talked about the leadership coming from the pastor. And then ministries, this is, I think, the last handout. One more time, guys and girls. As Dad, you say at Cowboy Church, we don't give titles, we give jobs. Because of Ephesians 2.10, I believe everyone, every follower of Jesus needs a job. Right? Surely you told your kids that, but anyway... Um, here's one reason with work with job with responsibility comes ownership you kids quit fighting over the jobs board just make sure everybody gets one good grief so many of these are listed as ministry the word ministry means to serve a minister is nothing more than a servant and there are all kinds of ministries at cowboy church some require a little bit of time some require a lot of time some require A lot of manual labor, some not so much. And you will see those listed. There may be some that have not been listed. You'll also find the names of the people that you need to visit with. You can either call, text, or email them. You might not want to do it all at once in the next hour. But FYI for our children's workers, children, youth. So that's under Bible study ministry, youth ministry. All of those volunteers and workers, you have to have a background check. And so if you're interested in serving in that area, just know ahead of time, the first thing we're going to ask you to do is to give us permission to do a background check on you. Um, I wonder what is. Oh, well, again, not to be offensive to any of the deacons, but FYI, we used to say we have a deacon training program at Cowboy Church. It begins next month with our first team roping. If you're interested in serving as a deacon at Cowboy Church, you'll meet us an hour before the roping begins here on the property. We'll get the wheelbarrow and the poop rake, and we're going to teach you how to pick up after horses. Come to my house. You know, I'm happy to share with you some some official religious deacons from other churches probably take offense to that. But I got to tell you, through the years, it's been a joy to see how many people are happy to come and to serve. That's what we consider entry level. And one of the other things we say at Cowboy Church, as your pastor, I'll never ask you to do something I'm not willing to do myself. And so I have shoveled a significant amount of horse manure off of these parking lots. And so, um, like I said, if you can get through that, you might have a, oh, you might love that job. Some people never want to graduate. They're selfish for that. They actually argue about who gets to shovel poop first. It's a glorious thing. All right. I believe, she's like, no, they can have that. If, if you prefer to keep your hands cleaner, you can work in the, with the kitchen crew or the, there's Taco Tuesday, the kitchen ministry. No, that's in the kitchen here. I'm trying to find it. Oh, concession stand. There it is, concession stand ministry. That's, okay, humbly, we pretty much have the reputation for serving the best hamburgers in town through our concession stand with the team ropings. You don't have to believe me. You can believe a bunch of people from some of these RV parks, they don't come to watch the team roping, but by George, about 11.30, they show up in droves to get one of the hamburgers and tolerate the team roping just to enjoy the hamburgers. So anyway, that's my story. I'm sticking to it. So here's kind of in wrap-up. I mentioned the cards. If you've been worshiping with us for a short time, for a long time, whatever, number one, if you want to be an official member of Cowboy Church, which I probably should have said this early on, 
technically, official members of Cowboy Church have no more privileges and benefits than those that aren't. After you went through the whole seminar. What does that mean? That means that we're committed to pretty much treating everybody the same. So when people come in, I don't see you as, oh, this is a member, this isn't a member. Because that can be the first dividing line to trouble. In the other churches I served as pastor, I know you won't be surprised that at two different churches, I offended the wealthier, wealthiest members of the church. And the treasurers chided me for running off the people that gave the most money. But I never got fired from those churches. That's probably a miracle. Um, but at our church, m money matters, but it doesn't matter that much. You have in your hand a brochure that says mission matters. And at Cowboy Church, we're committed to the mission first, and we guard that closely. We're not interested in any individual or group taking over any agendas that are foreign to the calling that we have to be followers of Christ and to be faithful to tell others. So, um, however, some people come from a membership background, and I, we never want to discourage you. By the way, here's been a little check for me. Because I'm also the associational missionary, and I, call, I lead, I don't really lead, but I serve a group of 20 plus churches in the area. We have people that attend Cowboy Church from many communities where some of those churches exist. And because we've never asked people to join the church, I have immunity. You know about preachers being cheap sealers? I actually got busted. Last Saturday, I met a celebration of life for my predecessor in that missionary job. And I see this girl with a guy and she's all cowgirled up. And I start talking to her, and I said something to her about coming to Cowboy Church. And some random woman accosts me, I mean, fronts me, and accuses me of trying to be a sheep stealer. I'm like, anyway, <laughs> busted. I was like, I didn't invite her to join. I just invited her to visit. But anyway, uh, but because we never ask anybody to join the church, I can never be accused of stealing sheep from another church. Amen? Amen. Works great. But if you listen closely, we always invite people to put their faith in Jesus. We invite people to follow with believer's baptism. And so if you know for sure you're a follower of Jesus and you've been baptized by immersion and you sense God's telling you that you need to plant your life here at Cowboy Church to be an official member, you can either tell me to my face, I've made that decision. I have followed Jesus in believer's baptism and God wants me to be here. I'll have you fill out a card. We'll put you on the official membership roll. And we'll keep treating you like we treat you now. Not very well, but we're going to keep treating you. <laughs> I was going to say, and I'll start sending you an email and asking for money every week. <laughs> no, we're not going to do that. Uh, again, if you've not followed Jesus in believer's baptism, we want you to do that not as a trip or a trick to get you to be a member. We invite you to do that in obedience to Jesus. And so there's a gentleman on live stream with us today that's in another state that is, has a connection with our church through some other members. And he's going through this class with us today, and he's asked if I would baptize him. Well, he lives in another state, but he plans to visit here sometime in the future. And I said, absolutely. And I told him, and I know it's kind of weird, we require baptism to be an official member, but we'll baptize anybody that's obedient to Jesus, whether they want to be a member or not. Because the first mission is to do what Jesus says, amen? amen. All right, that's it. I'm ready. I think I'm ready. Let me get some water. Raise your hand first. Who's got a question? Let's fill in the blanks first. Does anybody have any blank that you didn't get filled in that you're dis disappointed? Oh, how did I miss that? Is that the only one I missed? That is huge. Uh, I need to tell them. You're right. I'm trying to figure out where I missed that. It is. I'm using old notes. Did I miss anything else in your notes? Very important. Number one, we do funerals, celebrations of life. Whatever. When people die, we do memorial services at Cowboy Church. Half for a long time. Those are great opportunities for us to tell people about Jesus. Amen? Amen. And generally, I don't, like, I don't do many services where I don't have permission from the family to preach Jesus. And if I don't have permission from the family, guess what? I usually preach Jesus anyway. <laughs> That's what they get for doing it here. We do not do weddings at Cowboy Church. Listen very closely. Everything I've already told you. Now listen closely. We believe in marriage. The Bible teaches much about marriage. Amen? Yes, Pastor, it does. We believe it, we preach it, we teach it. But we do not do weddings. And we do not host weddings at Cowboy Church. And initially, primarily, it's because in Scripture there is 
a reference in the New Testament to Jesus attending a wedding. No place in the Word of God does the Word of God say a pastor should be doing weddings. Now, I've done a bunch. Your founding pastor has done a bunch. But the Bible doesn't say that's our main mission or even a secondary mission. That is a cultural thing and a government thing, to tell you the truth. All the weddings we did was always in the name of the state, by the state of Arizona, by the state of Washington, by the state of Texas. I proclaim you husband and wife. We, we were working free agents for the government. Now, I know you're surprised that this is not a big stand against the government. It is a big stand against protecting ourselves against the government. So because we do not do weddings at Cowboy Church, we do not have to rewrite our Constitution and bylaws. We do, we do subscribe to a legal service that will protect our freedom of religion rights. But since we don't do any weddings at all, nobody can ever sue us for not doing a wedding. Do, you, do I need to explain that to you? Because at Cowboy Church, you know, I know you're all thinking it's the homosexual agenda. That's part of it. But, you know, some cowboys lose their minds, too. I don't want to have to marry some dude to his horse. That'd be very strange. <laughs> Steve, Steve is going to say we're going to delete that from the email. No. In all seriousness, though, that's why. And so I want you to hear clearly. We're, here's what that does for us anyway. For me personally, my convictions about marriage, divorce, remarriage, many people will come to me and ask, and I want to I want marry you anyway. And then through the years, I've told people no, and those people usually understand when I explain to them what I believe the Bible teaches. But you would surprise, you'd be surprised how many church me members get mad because they hear through the grapevine, Pastor Tim wouldn't marry so-and-so. We don't think that's fair. You know what I'm saying? That's not our purpose. I'll send, you to, I'll send you to a good justice of the peace if you need to get married, or I'll send you to a bad justice of the peace. I really don't care. <laughs> Those are weddings. The Bible speaks to us plenty about husband and wife. God's standards are very high, and so it is by choice that we do that to preserve our freedom as a church. And as a pastor, I preserve my freedom to boldly preach what the Bible says. And if you don't like it, like everything else, you can get over it, or as we say, Go down the road somewhere else. Which, by the way, kind of the heartbeat of Pastor... <laughs> no, it's not the heartbeat. <laughs> kind, of, kind of the default position of Cowboy Church. Uh, years ago, Dad was at a little country church that was just a little different. There was an individual that was a bit difficult. Dad said about him, well, listen, oh, so-and-so, he needs to go to church somewhere, but he doesn't need to go to church here. <laughs> and so we know, listen, Cowboy Church is not for everybody. These, when we used to push visitor's cards, we have over 3,000 visitors, the names of over 3,000 people that have filled out a card that have visited Cowboy Church. I'm glad they came. I hope they heard the gospel. But we're not here to please everybody. We're here to please one, and our focus is on pleasing him alone. Amen? Amen. All right. Now, more questions. Thank you for bringing that up. If you have something else I missed, feel free to bring it up. It's not in my notes. Yes. Okay, hang on. Let me get a hold of this. This is going to be offensive. Yes. I don't understand why you didn't do that when you don't. Helping me do what? I do sometimes. Amen. So let me be very clear. Thank you. Yeah, no, no. You know why? Because that happened about two years ago. <laughs> so thank you for bringing that up. You need to know Pastor Steve is one of our associates. Some of you know Pastor Chuck Craig, who had just been with us for about six months, had a heart attack, collapsed, passed away, left me back in this boat again. Uh, next week, a gentleman and his wife are coming down for a few days to spend time with us. He's recently, well, I don't know how recently, but he's retired, uh, but is willing, if God wants him to, he's willing to come help. And so it's not that we don't, you need to, I have an administrative assistant. We have a group of chaplains. We do, I do have a lot of help. Thank you for being concerned about me being burnt out. This is why you should always pray for your pastor. Amen. Amen. <laughs> we're, we're getting help, but good help's not always easy to find. And, and, and I'll just say this caveat in case some of you wonder how I came to be pastor here. My family and I were one of the founding families that helped the Cowboy Church. Lori used to run soundtracks and led the music in the first months of Cowboy Church. 
Uh, but we were involved in working in other churches at the same time and because Cowboy Church only met on Tuesday night. And then through the years, whenever dad would travel or go back vacation, I would fill the pulpit for him. And for five years, it was a more formal relationship. Uh, I was, well, technically I was dad's supervisor during those first few years, which is always awkward. But we, we made it work. And, and then gradually over time, I was basically an associate pastor. And then we co-pastored. Some of you here may remember there was a time when we were doing two and three services when dad and I would tag team on Sunday morning, meaning he would preach one or two services, I would preach one or two services. And then eventually I became the lead pastor. Dad had some health challenges, which renders him generally not able to preach anymore. So he does water the parking lot most Saturdays. Very important task if you ever wonder why it's so nice. Any other question? I was going to say comment or rude remark, but boy, I said, anybody else want to offend me? That's the best kind of offense. I'll, I'll take that kind of offense all day long. <laughs> Woo. Help me out. I'm also pleased, to, if you haven't heard, uh, I'm not only pleased, but I am deeply grateful and humbled by the fact that last month when we launched our pastor school, we have, each week we've had over 20 men attend the pastor school. Amen. Amen. The reason, they're not, the reason they're not clapping loud or some of them are in here and they're like, oh, no. In a year from now, he's going to put us all to work. <laughs> well, God does the putting to work, but we're trying. We're trying. It's just sometimes a long runway. Any other questions or comments? Woo, y'all have been phenomenal. Make sure you have all the paper stuff. Make sure you take it home with you. It is time. It's 1130. She says, really? And by the way, some of you may have questions that you don't want to ask publicly. Just hang out. I will hang out here until all you questions are answered to the best of my ability. But if you need to come get a card and fill it out, please do so. If you need to talk to me personally, do so. Otherwise, it's 1131. We started at 931. Hallelujah. Thanks, guys. You're out of here. Thank you. Thank you. Yes.